Blog Talk Radio. Raw living is a state of mind, a way of being in alignment with your body. Raw living means you put yourself and your body first. Your host, Gita Sadu Rob, is the founder of Nosh Detox, located in the UK. They offer innovative raw food smoothies sold across Europe. You experience it in your skin, your body, and your mind. And now it's time for Living Raw Radio. Good evening, everybody. This is Living Raw Radio, and I'm your host, Gita Sidhu Rob. Actually, I wonder, should I be like a host S, or should you be like a host? The connotations aren't really great, so I think we might stay with the host. And we're going to have a session today that I'm really, really excited about. There are two things I'm passionate about completely. One of them is business, and the other one is actually spirituality. And I think that both those things are things that I find amazing, I find them fascinating, and I've always done that independently and individually. But for me, the twain have never met. Business for me is always about making money, it's about working, it's about structures, processes, infrastructure. How do you make things work so you make more profit? How do you make things work so you spend less on costs? You know, that stuff, the mechanical, day-to-day, the processes. But spirituality... Ah, now that's different. That feeds my soul. That's something that's emotional. It's something personal. It's something mental. It's something that I practice for my heart and my soul. And now if I said to somebody, I practice business from my heart, you know, seriously, they'd, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure that they would laugh me out the room. And if I said, well, I've got to practice spirituality and check my return on investment, and see what I get, pretty, pretty certain that the spiritualists would be laughing me out the room. So it's not, I've never really found a way to marry both my passions together and and to look at them and say, here they are, and they both move me, and they move many people, and there must be a way to put them together. So I was really excited when the way life is, chance led me to meeting really, really interesting and special man. And our guest tonight is that man. His name is Marcus Weston. And Marcus is somebody that I met not so long ago, but I've sort of kept him in my mind's eye as somebody who I wanted to give an opportunity to give a platform to because he's just such an interesting man. He started in a career in finance, so he did the whole business thing, and he had some very, very well-known and hardcore establishments that he's worked in. He worked in Goldman Sachs. He worked in Citibank. And a hop, skip, and a jump later, he moved forward and talks about spirituality, and he talks about how spirituality works in business. Now, I, I don't know how you do that. And so I'm thinking that what we're going to do is we're going to find out today. So if you have any questions, remember you can just call in and the number is 001 if you're calling from the UK, 347-205-9224. You can Skype in as well and give us messages on the dashboard, which we can then read out. But we'd really look forward to hearing from you. And I'm just going to check. Hopefully Marcus is with us. Hi, Marcus. Are you there? Okay. Hello. He's not there at the moment. So I guess he'll join us in a little while. So sitting with the concept of how you do business and whether you can do heart-shaped business or you can't do heart-shaped business, um, what I'm trying to find is a way where I can sit and I can do business and I can understand the processes of how we create wealth, how we create abundance, and still use those structures in order to be with people and help people and care about what people do. When I worked as a corporate lawyer, which I did for over a decade, I found that what I was doing was sitting and waiting for a place where someone was going to be nice because actually they weren't nice all the time. It was something that they found really, really difficult to do. And they just, 
it, it was all about cutthroat. It was about how much money could you make, when could you make that money, what would you do to make it, how fast could that operate. And it was never a space where what you were actually doing was saying that I, I care about these people, I want to be able to help them. And if that, that was there, it was something you felt personally. You also had to end up hiding it because you couldn't be what was called a bleeding heart. It's just not something that you could do. You couldn't turn around and say, um, you know, I really like those people. They can't really afford my services, but I care about what they're thinking about. Um, and, and I care to help them. And can I please help them no matter what happens? And it, it just was inappropriate. I mean, how many of you have found that? How many of you have found that you go to work and you think, um, can I help this person? Can I make life better for them? Can I work with them? And, and, and it's not, not within the remit unless they can afford you and they can pay for it. And they can do those things. It's just not possible. So we take what is nice about us. We take what is personal about us. We take what is loving about us. And we make that something that doesn't happen at work. I mean, is it any surprise that the banks crash, that corporate governance shows up with a lack of integrity, a lack of morality, that it shows up badly, right, badly behaved, and that you look at people and there's another, there's another crisis every single time? Um, because you just don't bring your, your feelings and your heart into work. So, you know, apparently Marcus is now joining us, so he's going to help us make some sense of this, I'm hoping. So, Marcus, are you there? Yes. Hey. How are you? I'm so well. It's really good to have you with us. It's lovely to uh, to hear your voice again. <laughs> While I warbled <laughs> on about how you differentiate between business and biz- and the heart. But right. it's kind of true, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, like you said, traditionally, there's been um, a, a very definitive Chinese wall between um, are you business oriented or are you spiritual oriented never the twain should meet mm-hmm. and uh, and my passion um, has always been that that the two must meet in fact any spirituality that hasn't got a sense of, of real life to it I think is a bit airy fairy and escapism and any business that hasn't got a sense of, of consciousness to it is destructive and so I've always been passionate about how to combine those two in a very practical way, in a very uh, performant way, and a very results-driven way. Okay, so hang on a minute. That uh, Clearly, it's a big, big hop, skip, and a jump, right? So you, you start at Goldman Sachs and Citibank, yes. <laughs> which yes. is the bastion of hardcore, cold-eyed, ruthless capitalism. <laughs> Well, there it was, is, right? Well, it, there, there was this, I mean, I, I'm sure many people saw this on the internet. There was that fantastic or, 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 or horrific, whichever way you look at it, um, fantastical perhaps is more appropriate, interview with um, a U.S. trader mm. being interviewed by a, um, a BBC, BBC presenter. And it was in, in, in the wake of a, of a potential crash. And the BBC presenter was uh, overly concerned, saying how awful the situation was. And this uh, this trader was saying how fantastic things were. As long as, as long as the markets move, we make a fortune. And she asked him, well, uh, isn't that particularly insensitive? Aren't you just ashamed that when everyone is losing their homes and wealth and fortunes, you're making a fortune? And the guy responded with a classic line. He said, don't be so naive. Who do you think runs the world? Goldman Sachs run the world. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, That's however... That's really out there. <laughs> However, uh, jovial or serious he was, there is a, a, a great sense as to how I think the private sector does run the world. I think governments um, are less and less able, they're less and less wealthy, I think their coffers are, are empty to really deliver social change, which well, we will also, need. Yeah, but not even just the coffers. I'm not sure the willingness is there, frankly. Yeah, I think that's probably the, the cause of the fact the coffers are empty. And, and, and I think the effect of that is very much that now the responsibility of society falls very firmly in the private sector's hands. Mm. And so I think the private sector doesn't just have an ability to help. It now has the global responsibility to help. Okay. So we moved from Goldman Sachs runs the world yes. to the government not being able to help. That's why private sector haven't a responsibility to help. Why should I 
when I get up at five in the morning, for example, and go to bed at seven o'clock at night or ten o'clock at night, and I make a million pounds a year, and I'm doing this, I'm paying taxes. Why do I have a responsibility to help you? Didn't you ask for what you needed already? Well, I don't differentiate between. I mean, if you look at the 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 um the debt crisis, which the world is is almost inescapably in the middle of, mm. um, you look at the last credit crunch. Who's really to blame? I mean, one looks at governments and institutions and mortgage lenders as the, the pariah of the state right now. And yet there is also the Tom Jones who walked into a bank who says, well, I've got a value asset worth £100,000. Um, I want a mortgage of £150,000. Now, although it's a smaller scale, uh, that's also taking more than, than you have. Um, so well, yeah, I'm not but defending... if you give it to me, why am I stupid? And why am I wrong? I, I, I would never dare say you're stupid or wrong. I think you're... <laughs> Especially not on air, okay? <laughs> However, if I come in and I give you £100 and then I ask you to give me £150, would you do it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think that, um, uh, that, that either are, are blameless. What I'm saying is that, that you know, it's society's fault as well. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I don't want to put too, uh, um, or I don't want to take any focus from... Um, uh, um, uh, uh, government and from institutions because clearly there is an issue in their lack of responsibility. Uh, yeah. I remember in the, in the, in the Tottenham riots uh, a year and a half ago um, uh, when some looters were, were, were caught and clearly doing the most horrific things and one of them, rightly or wrongly, rightly or wrongly said, I'm doing nothing different than the government who steals from me every day or corporations and fat cats who also steal from me every single day. Now, not to justify what he does, but it is a, an interesting kind of social picture uh, uh, that he presents. And again, I don't want to get involved in... Well, it's a breakdown right of trust, wrong. isn't it, that we're talking about that? Yeah, and I think you it exists think that otherwise. in every level. And, so, and, whoa, hang on. Why did you move from fat well, cat corporate to... I, I, where did you go next? Yeah, I went through... Take us through a, your journey, because I'm really interested in how you got to where you got to. Okay. I promised to talk about that, too, but I want to know how you got there. <laughs> well, I, I graduated from university. I went straight into investment banking. Um, uh, it was in a time when I think there weren't many of my friends who were, who were uh, as well employed. I was very fortunate. I went through um, a few years in investment banking, and I eventually was sick of it, <laughs> actually. I yeah. eventually... Just literally, I was waking up every single morning, getting on the northern line, thinking, what the hell am I doing? And, and, and a very telling sign to me was I would get on in, in the north near, near High Barnet. I would come all the way down the northern line to Citibank in, in, in London Bridge. And right at the same time, a guy from Highgate used to come in and sit in exactly the same seat opposite me every single day. Wow. And he'd wear this huge smile ear to ear. Literally, gleaming and beaming smile like he, the joy of life was his. And every single day, I hated him more. And I, and I never spoke to him. I never, you know. You never asked I, him why? I never asked him why. I hated him. I couldn't <laughs> hate him. <laughs> and so it was a very funny thing that it dawned on me, like, why on earth do I have such resentment to such a happy person? It's because clearly there was something so desperately missing within Mm. And so um, I sat in a in a pub in St John's Wood one um, one evening with a couple of friends, and uh, after two beers or three beers, we joked, "Wouldn't it be funny if we quit tomorrow morning and just went travelling around the world and said to hell with it?" And and then we just carried on the evening. Anyway, the following morning he called me and he said, "Have you done it?" So I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "I just quit. Have you?" <laughs> so I, I oh my God, Marcus, you are so stuffed. I thought we were joking. So I thought, you know what? Maybe it's not such a silly idea. So I did it very spontaneously. I just How old thought are you? Of, I was, I must have been 23, 20, no, 24, 24. And, um, and so I did it. And, I, and it was the most liberating thing. I remember feeling a weight off my shoulders like I never felt before. And so I went traveling around the world. And I went to places, especially in Asia, that just opened my mind, inspired my heart. I remember that one of my first stops was in Jakarta. I got out of the mm. bus, and it was pouring with rain. It was a miserably gray day, and I was all alone. And I knew I had to check in to all the youth hostels to meet people. And, and I, I couldn't bring myself to do it. I checked myself into a hotel. <laughs> 
Um, and I walked out all alone. And I had, you know, my phone and my credit card, and I was fine. And I was miserable. And uh, and I saw as it belted down with rain, these kids, because of the rain, come out and play in the rain. Oh, we used to do that because the rain is warm. Oh, it was it was so joyous. It was such a vivid picture, though. And I thought to myself, what the hell am I doing? I'm such an, an illusional world. So I thought, that's it. I'm taking a little bit of cash out. I'm going to dump the credit card, dump the phone. I checked into the youth hostels and just traveled all around the world. It's the best thing I ever did. I met people from everywhere, and it was just inspiring. And I came back thinking, you know what? I haven't got the same values anymore. I want to do something in the world. I know. How, I how long did you take? How long did you do that for? I was traveling for about nine months. Cool. Mm-hmm. Gestational yeah. period, clearly. Yeah, completely, yes. <laughs> yeah, and it really it gave birth to a whole new consciousness. Um, and and I literally, I, I came back saying to myself, I don't ever want to work for anyone ever again. Um, and that lasted about a month. I went back to Goldman Sachs because <laughs> I wanted <laughs> I did the money. Um, so, you know, it kind of tripped me up. But but it didn't last long. And, and within a very short period of time, I set up my own business. Um, I was I opened a, a headhunting and recruitment consultancy mm-hmm. with a fantastic guy, a very, very special soul who was uh, equally spiritual. And we both kind of were on these spiritual paths now. I just found my spiritual path. I was investing. I was studying. I was learning. I was really seeing things about myself and the world that I never knew about before and was mm. feeling very inspired. Um, and business now became a means to that end. And so I was motivated in my business like I never had been. So, in fact, what you were doing was instead of accumulating and amassing wealth, you were creating abundance. Yes. Would you say that that shift had happened there? Definitely, yes. And and the abundance, I think, has the flavor of for the sake of helping others. Because Mm -hmm. before it was about personal wealth creation, asset acquisition. You know, handbags really matter, Marcus. It's (laughs) important to remember these things. And shoes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> flip-flops and waitrose carrier bags ah <laughs> oh, what a man okay then you can go back to your story <laughs> no no teasing. but 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 you know it, it, it was a really um uh, a, a whole shift of business because now my real motivation was how to affect change in the world and i found a place where i could do it and it was a very personal place for me and so now business was a fantastic means whereas before it was the end and it was an unfulfilling end so my life was unfulfilled But this was now a means to an end, a very necessary means, a very positive means. Okay, and and you're now, by now, how old? I'm now 27 or so. Wow. 27, yeah. Okay. Did you have any other 27-year-olds that related to you? Um, Yeah, I think most of my friends were all entrepreneurial um, and wanted to aspire to their own independent things as opposed Mm to, you know, the kind of typical doctor, lawyer, accountant where you're just in for a set amount of time. Um, So I was in a good environment, I think. Um, An environment unquestionably helps you. I think if you're in the wrong environment, you're you're in trouble, you know, because you can be a fantastic farmer, you can have the best crop, but if you've got the wrong soil, you're not going to produce. And um, and that's your environment, your soil. I really believe in, in having healthy people around you, powerful, positive, inspiring people who you can mentor and help and who can give you that same thing as well. Mm-hmm. I agree. Okay, so you get to 27. You're sitting there looking at the world and thinking, world, I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get you. I, what, I, I, was, I... what was the, the, the um, hmm, what's the word I'm looking for? What, were the, what would you say were the, was the driver behind that emotion? Oh, I wanted to own the world. Uh-huh. To do what with it when you owned it? Um, that was less important in the beginning. I just wanted to own it. <laughs> mm. um, clearly, that developed because I I wanted to slowly, really help people. Mm-hmm. And, and that became a very important path for me. What does that actually, mean, though? What does help? Sorry, I keep interrupting you. Just to, just to clarify. No, what well, does I wanted to help people mean? What does that mean for you? Well, that was a very um, uh, initial idea that evolved into a very deep concept because you're right what does it mean to help a person you know i'm sure every person who's listening has someone or many people whom you think they need help or i wish i could help more and the question of course in life is how some people you help by giving more some people you help actually by letting go and and how do you really help a person and so that became 
part of my study. How do you really help it? How can my business help people more? Is it just about the simplicity of making a bit of money and giving it to charity? And I think that's important for every person's life, but it was more than that. Is it about you know, spending time with a person? Is it about really giving your heart to a person? How do you help a person? And one of the things that I found was for me, and again, everyone is so different, and I guess my, my, my story isn't to, to preach, but more to, um, uh, to illuminate, to, uh, yeah, illuminate how everyone has to find their own path, not, not, not follow. Um, but I found that if I wanted to really remove, because that was what's in my mind, I, 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 wa- I started with wanting to own the world. Then I wanted to remove the pain from the world. Mm-hmm. And then stage three was, well, you know what? That's too ridiculous remove the pain from the person's life next year. If you can okay. help one person, you can help... So you went from many. the general to the specific? Yes, yeah. It's like and giving away money to charity, then thinking about the person, then yes. some, your neighborhood, then thinking about the one next to you. Yes, and, and then it went even further. Because, you know, if you imagine, if you walked into a classroom with a bunch of unemployed kids, which we do also a lot of youth unemployment, mm-hmm. um, that's part of how we, we give back, but... but, um, but you know, if you were a teacher in that 18, 25-year-old bracket of, of ex-offenders, of gang members, uh, of gun offenses, um, terminally unemployed, some people are unemployed for almost three, four generations. They've not known an employed parent or grandparent. It's yes, insane. that's really quite frightening. Mm. And, and you walked into that group and the teacher said, oh, good evening. My name is Cuthbert Smithington Smythe, uh, the third from Cheshire. And you I really said, are down on Cuthbert, aren't you, really, basically? <laughs> And I, I've been educated for the last 30 years at Harvard and, and Princeton and Oxford and Cambridge. I know every single thing and method as to how to educate you folk. And he would need a security guard. Completely, right? And if you're a, another teacher and you walk in, you say, you know what? I made a thousand mistakes in my life. I walked a mile in your shoes. I know exactly what it means. I've come out of prison, but I've taken some right choices, and I'm here for you. And I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm here to help you if you want. You know, that sense of of empathy is what works. And so what I'm saying is that if you want to help change someone else's life, you have to know your own pain. If you don't know your pain, you can't relate to someone else's pain. But it's so much nicer telling people what to do. (laughs) And, And that's what Goldman Sachs does. (laughs) <laughs> yes, there is that. We'll walk away from that now then. Yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so my point is for me it opened up a tremendously deep spiritual path to actually know and deliver how business can change the world. And and that for me became a very fascinating thing. So you've got there, you've set up your own business. Yes. And you were doing what at that point in time? Um uh, I I actually left business for a little bit of time to take time out to go intensively study. Um, right. And I what def- were you studying? Well, I, 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 I'm one of those avid researchers. I, I think, you know, you haven't got to reinvent the wheel. Um, so I, I went around looking at people who I think are great masters through history, Plato, Pythagoras, Newton, Freud, Einstein, people who have not maybe life perfect, but who have who've legacies. They've done something that still inspires people. And I found there was one common strand that they all had. They studied something called Kabbalah. And so I was intrigued, what on earth is this thing called Kabbalah? And so I Googled and found the Kabbalah Center in London. And that, for me, became a really inspiring place where there were very tremendous amounts of people from every walk of life uh, who were looking to study something spiritual and try and improve their lives for the sake of helping others. Right. And so that really touched my heart. And um, being quite a cynical person, I think I walked in very first uh, with my eyes open, but actually a bunch of very amazing people doing some very great things. And so I, I jumped in eventually, and so I wanted to study with some very great Kabbalah teachers around the world who became my teachers eventually, the Rav and Karen Berg. And I went intensively to study. Um, I kind of took a sabbatical, if you like. Wow. Okay, so this is a good place to take a break. And then we are going to come back, and I want to know more about that because I want to understand, again, what, uh, how that, I mean, I hear so much about how it moves people, but I don't get it. So I want to hear a little bit about that, and then we'll tie it all up together by, by linking that with 
business and what you're doing. Great. So this is Living Rural Radio, and this is your host, Gita Sidhu Rob. And we're going to be back in a few short minutes. We're just going to take a little break. winning company for your ultimate health improvement. Nosh Detox System works on all areas of the body, having dealt with thousands of clients whose health dramatically improved within days. For more details, visit noshdetox.com. Noshdetox.com. Welcome back, and this is Living Raw Radio, and I'm your host, Geeta Sidhu Rob, joined by the most fascinating guest, Marcus Weston. Now, Marcus is going to tell us something about something that is maybe controversial, maybe just interesting. Personally, I'm just fascinated. He actually, just before the break, brought up the concept of Kabbalah. And Marcus, I know that you, 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 you kind of jumped just a little bit past this, but tell me, Okay, so, so you went into the study of Kabbalah, and it was something that, that you found so interesting that you start, you did it for years, right? Yeah, yeah. Tell, yeah, tell me a little bit about Kabbalah. What, what, define it for me. Well, Is it a, a religion? No, no, that's the myth. Most people okay, there are Kabbalah, Kabbalah texts, right, which are yes. hundreds and thousands of years old. Yes, I mean, the, the first book on Kabbalah was 4,000 years ago, written by Abraham the Patriarch. And in it describes really how the universe works, what life's about, why we're here, what the purpose of life is, how to understand yourself, and how to find your place in this world. And it's a very generic spiritual concept that can become very profound, but really empowers you to be more fulfilled, to be happier, to be more excited about life, to be more aware of yourself, to find more responsibility, to be more conscious of things around you, and to understand the world in better context. So it gives you a framework and structure within which to approach the world. Exactly, yeah. That I mean, sounds really attractive. Well, it's interesting for me because I, I have such a, a kind of left brain um, to understand something so spiritual and so deep to explain life um, uh, became a fascination just from the point of view. It's just a very systematic approach to your own spiritual evolution. And mm. that's something I believe in. You know, I think that if you kind of, and that's, by the way, a business principle, I think, if, which is yeah, a spiritual business principle perhaps. But if you make a choice that either in life everything is random or nothing is. Either everything is by mistake haphazard or there is a purpose and a point concealed to things that happen to you. And I, I just was always of the view, and everyone is very different, but I had the view that I felt there was just some method in the madness. There was some underlying theory to the chaos. And even so science talks about that now, actually. So what, what, and obviously I'm pronouncing this incorrectly because you're saying Kabbalah instead of Kabbalah. So Kabbalah, you rocked up, you found somebody who said, okay, this is what this says. 
And you were like, oh, wow, can I know more? And they said, okay, then it says this. And then you said, can I know more? So it was a form of a teaching as opposed to a religious kind of a experience. Yeah, it's like university. It's like university. Yeah. I mean, a very successful friend of mine who became a business partner uh, was studying, and I saw it really changed his life. And so he kept saying, come along as this free intros. Come along to all the free classes on success or relationships or even more mystical stuff like, you know, astrology, reincarnation, the very practical stuff. And so I came to a very practical lecture because that was more my cup of tea. Mm. And uh, and I sat down and I just thought, you know, it's it's amazing actually. It just put the dots together in such a simple way. But I thought, okay, I'll, I'll study a couple more classes and a couple more classes and a couple more classes. And so it's a walk-in, walk-out policy. You kind of come and go and come and go. And uh, I guess I kind of came more than I went. Yeah, so it's like a loose mind, a loose, not loose-minded, forgive me, <laughs> a very serious-minded, a loose community yeah, kind structure of, of people yeah. that feel and think the same way. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, so, and so how'd you all get, uh, get Madonna? <laughs> yeah, there's very rarely a conversation that, that won't link Kabbalah to Madonna. What's interesting is there are about you know four or five other million normal people like you or me who uh, who, who, who study. Um, and the few celebrities who do, I think, either, you know, get or give a bad rap. But I guess I tell you what, most people in high profile positions are, are, are emptier than the rest of us. And they need a lot more kind of spiritual support to understand themselves well, and life. Then also, then also, you know, you and I aren't as interesting as someone like, like a celebrity to the majority well, of people. definitely me. I think you sound as interesting as, as anyone famous I've met. Sweetie, just because I have you trapped on radio for an hour, <laughs> you'll say anything. But when you're looking at someone like Madonna, I mean, that, that, you know, I did something very naughty, of course, because I Googled you, because I Google everybody, and apparently you spiritually advised Madonna and Guy. I, I, far more fascinating for me is, is going to a third world country and giving spiritual advice to a village. Or, or walking into Goldman Sachs and sitting with the CEO and explaining how their corporate social responsibility can not just be a PR or a tax issue and change the world. That, that's the real stuff we do. I yeah, mean, and you so, so didn't answer that question, and I'm clocking it and, in the and, next time. Totally on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. We'll let you get away with that, because that would be rude. But, so... You and you rocked up to no, Goldman Sachs. But you understand, if, 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 if you were studying and someone said, oh, tell me about Gita, I mean, I wouldn't dream to, to, to share all, even the wonderful things about you because it's just not, it's not, it's not correct. No, clearly, but I mean, how could I not ask you? I mean, it would be totally unreasonable <laughs> to me not to ask you. Don't be silly. So you rock up to the CEO of Goldman Sachs and you say, look, you've really got to pay more attention to the spiritual aspects of what you do. If you've got to pay more attention to loving and helping and supporting and nurturing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think he personally, loves? especially in England, you cannot use the word spirituality in a business meeting um, because it either has one of two connotations. Either it's kind of airy-fairy and mumbo-jumbo and it's kind of, you know, up there with the fairies or it's religious and both are wrong. Um, when I say spirituality, I'm talking about, you know, your spirit, your internal strength, your resilience, your core, what you do, how you do it, and why you do it, what gets you up in the morning, the roots of you in the DNA of your soul, what makes you you. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think one of the best things in the courses that we do in all the business gym courses is that we introduce everyone to someone they've never met before, which is not Madonna, it's themselves. And I think many of us are really not honest with who we are because we're kind of different people to different people. When you're with your boss, your employee, when you're with your friend or that social circle or your parents or your kids, we're different people to different people. We have this great pretense as to how successful we are or we have this pro projection as to how successful we'd like others to think of us. And, and we're very rarely us. And because we're not us, it's almost like we're not present. The universe can't find us, and so we're not as successful as we could be because we're kind of hidden. So you're and saying we are becoming our clothing instead of who we really are. Yes, yes. And, now, okay, and, yeah. if you're, why do you think using the word spiritual in a business meeting is taboo? What is your experience? I mean, like, for example, do you find for the U.S. that they're more open to it than in for Europe sure. and England? Yeah. Why? Definitely. Because 
if you think about how the president of the United States gets elected, he by default at the moment has to have a religious connotation, uh, an affiliation. Mm -hmm. They have to be a good Christian or a good this or a good that. If the Prime Minister of England advertised his religious desires, I think he'd get laughed out of Parliament. Um, it's just not the done thing. And, and it's a very funny thing. But anything that has a religious connotation in this country is taboo. And, and that's okay, because I think religion has more to answer to uh, for in the world than anything else. I think probably... You know, uh, religion has criminalized the idea of a creator, and more deaths have been because of it. Uh, uh, the misuse, rather, religiosity as a misuse of the original spiritual idea behind religion. Um, so I understand that. And so I think it's, you know, at first we thought, let's just knock that door down and confront it, and it just became impossible. So you find no one was listening to the rest of what you were saying because they're no one can talk listen. about that stage. Even legally, people are scared in a company to have the word spirituality there because there is a religious connotation and the HR department of any company legally will put up flags um, and so it doesn't need to be because it's not anything which has any religious it doesn't even mention the idea if there was a creator the business gym stuff that we teach is really very uh, uh, corporately tested and it's very uncontroversial although it's very tough and it's like a boot camp of your life well, because why do you? No, we're we're going, to, we're going to come to your courses. Why is it that you? Let me think. What am I trying to say? You're saying that when you bring up spirituality, people put connotations of religion in it, yes. right? Yes. And when they put the connotation of religion on it, their brain switches off and they don't want to know because they think religion or God and business aren't in the same place. Yes. But you know that's that's just just to go back to my heritage for a minute. In the East, that's not true at all. Yeah. No, so I think we should define that a little bit better because when we take our first paychecks home, for example, mm -hmm. you always take some of the money that you make on your first paycheck and you take it to the temple. Right. And, and, and charity is is you know the root of of many religions. Um, uh, England is very particular. This great country, I think, in a league table of the world. Of, of those who believed in a higher power, England was either the bottom in the world or the second to bottom. <laughs> wow. So there are the least amount of, of people in this country, in the world, who believe in a higher power. And that's fine because, you know, the truth is you haven't got to, but it isn't a subject that you can bring up around the boardroom, primarily because there's legal issues, but also it's very personal. And and in England, we're quite concealed with our, our personal uh, uh, beliefs and uh, and we don't want to air them. We don't need. Yeah, them. and also that thing about dinner parties, isn't it? You don't talk politics and you don't talk religion. Yes. Yeah. So what yeah. would happen if you approach this from? Because I know that this is something you've thought a lot about, and I know that it's something that you care a great deal about. Yes. So, have you approached it from the concept of coming uh, like the universe and the law of attraction? Is that yeah. also yeah. taboo? Yeah. No, that's fine. That's fine. Very many. As long people... as you don't mention God, they don't mind. Completely, yeah, completely. And, and, and you know, the, the fact is that, paradoxically, there is a tremendous wave in this country, which is where, you know, I focus my efforts because I'm passionate about it. I, I, I think personally, I, I'm very, you know, I'm very kind of a, a, um, <clears throat> proud of, of, of actually being British because I think it's, a, it's an empire that has affected change in the world, lost its empire, and can still affect change in the world, but from a, a more kind of social and spiritual route, um, because you know most people's most countries' legal system uh, um, financially it's still so powerful. England is a tremendous force of, of power in the world still, um, uh, and and I forget your question now, but but, but I was very excited <laughs> to say that. <laughs> well, I'm saying that what happens. Um, if you go out and you talk about the law of attraction and right. instead of talking about God. And that was right. really That's, what my, my point is. Yeah. And you're saying that you're... Is so what we're doing is we're basically isolating this. We're saying that it's a Western phenomenon more than necessarily an Eastern or a global phenomenon. Well, more of an English phenomenon, actually. A very English phenomenon then, yeah. okay. Yeah. And we're yeah. saying that it's limited to using things that smack of organized religion. Yes, Therefore, anything to do with God and spirituality instinctively means that. Absolutely, yes. 
So therefore, you have to leave that out of it. Right. So, <laughs> let me get this right. You have to rock up all the time and talk about business and talk about spirituality and never actually mention the white elephant in the room. Yes. And it's wow. fine. It's fine. And you know what? The truth is, because that was my path, I get that. And I, I'm good with that. And, I, and, I, and I'm passionate. And this is why I, I forgot your question before. But what I was going to say was, there is an amazing, overwhelming desire that's growing in this country to understand um, deeper spiritual paths that are not yeah, religious oriented. And, and, you know, whether it's a meditation course here or a self-help course there or a Kabbalah here, it's just overwhelming how many people are flooding through the doors, leaving religion because it's not served them. And I kind of get that as well. Um, uh, and flocking into something which has a more communal, more global, more unifying outlook. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that does unite us in the world is what's inside, that part of our soul. That's what I think. And um, we need to invest in that part. And we're very clever to invest in how we look and how we dress and how strong we get muscularly in the gym and how intelligent we are for, for work. And we don't invest in our insights. We don't invest in, y in yourself. How do you well, receive? Well, no one can see it, Marcus. Don't be unreasonable. Well, I think life wakes you up to it eventually. I think oh. everyone can see it if you choose to listen. And, um, and, and also, as you get older, it shows up on the outside. You can yeah. see those people you walk past with the creases and looking miserable, and that's their face in repose, and you're thinking yeah. that has to be what's coming out. And, so and I was very young. I mean, I didn't have any spiritual desire, nor did I have any, you know, age-old chaos. I came because I wanted to make so much money um, that I was looking at different paths that would make me more successful. And I l went through a lot of physical courses and time management and sales, and, and they were just so tedious and boring. I read a 100 books on leadership, and they also were not personal. You get desire. You haven't got desire. I had desire. I was still yeah. as rich as I wanted to be. So, so what's the missing link? And, and so I thought, I've got to try something different. And so for me, that kind of spiritual path was, a, was a, an so obvious one. But it wasn't about being is, spiritual. It was about getting more money. Yeah, the universe is very clever. I mean, yeah. all paths lead to where they're meant to go to. And if that's yeah. the fastest way to get you there and to get you to focus. Yeah, it's true. Yeah? Yeah. So I want to go quickly to a break. And when we come back... I want to talk to you about your actual courses. So what, right. what to expect when someone comes? How do you feel? What are the successes you've had? And what would you constitute a success even? Because you know me, mm. I want to add, drill down to the thing of, of what it actually means. <laughs> yeah. so, this is Living Raw Radio. I'm, this, I'm your host, Gita Sidhu Rob, and we're going to see you, speak to you, and you can hear us again in a couple of minutes. We'll be with you soon. really low? Do you find everything that you eat goes straight to fat? My name is Candice and I am the naturopathic nutritionist at Nosh Detox. I am here to tell you that your body needs a rest. If that sounds like you, you are ready to try a Nosh Juice Fast. A Juice Fast is the most natural way for your body to detox while providing you all the life-saving minerals and vitamins that your body needs and craves. From beginners to advanced juices, we have all the options that may be available to you or suited to you. Call me on 0845-257-6674 or go to noshdetox.com and click on the right program for you. I'm right here to help you and support you. Thank you. Nosh Detox is an award-winning company for your ultimate health improvement. Nosh Detox system works on all areas of the body, having dealt with thousands of clients whose health dramatically improved within days. For more details, visit noshdetox.com. Noshdetox.com. Living Raw Radio.
Radio, and I'm your host, Dita Sidorob, and I'm here with Marcus Weston. We're about to get into the nitty and the gritty hmm, of the spirituality. I couldn't get that to rhyme. I'm really clearly <laughs> not going to do DJing in my spare time or rapping. Um, so, Marcus, what we found, you came on this journey. You discovered Kabbalah. Yes. You discovered Madonna, although you won't discuss it with me, which is <laughs> really bad manners. You found that it married with your other passion, which was about business and the concept of business, the understanding of business. Mm. And you narrowed that down to, look, I care about the person who does the business, the people who are offering that service, and that this is now what you want to impact. Would that be a good, accurate synopsis? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Fine. So yeah. now you then go and you set up a course. Yes. Did I hear that right? That's right, yeah. Okay, so, so, so which does what? Well, I mean, the 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 whole and this idea. This is not a Kabbalah course. No, no, no. It? They're, 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 it's something completely independent. Um, right. This is what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, it's completely independent. My my personal spiritual study is independent of all the business courses we give. It just happens that it helps me to deliver them better and to understand people better. Because the truth is, when we work with companies, we work with governments, local governments, universities, schools, prisons. Uh, uh, um, and a whole ton of corporates and FIs. Um, you don't build the business; you build people. That, of that's course, really that's why team building is the root of anything you want to do. Basically, yeah, isn't and and team building, unfortunately, has kind of developed this idea of of going to Ibiza for a week or going to <laughs> a. Uh, uh, don't um, tell the people who work for me. We'll get <laughs> you know, that's not how you how you team build. That that wins you games. It doesn't win you championships. To win championships, right. you have to build every person individually. If, if, and what we do is we go into businesses and we say, you know what? When we change your life, you'll love to work. And, and not just that, but you'll see that the company that you work for has invested in your life change. And so the loyalty that you'll have to your company after we finished is going to be off the chart. And I'll give you one example. We went into a, a global uh, uh, client, uh, global management consultancy group. And there was a particular client who is a, a control freak, uh, uh, not a client, one of the partners there in one of the mm. offices, a complete control freak and wasn't letting in more clients, more partners. And, and they were near to firing him. Yeah. And so I went in and sat down with him and said, you know what, forget about business. You know, tell me about you. And it turned out his kids' exam marks and his wife's relationship. So I said, you know, if I can change your kids' exam marks in three months, and if I can make you go home to a nice, warmer environment to your wife within three months, will you listen to me when it comes to work? So he said, yes. So for three months, we worked and, and literally turned his entire life around, his kids, his You're family. moving in with me tomorrow, Marcus. I just want to know <laughs> that. I have teenagers and exams. So just, you, just so you know, you, yeah. Honestly, you couldn't afford me. Um, oh, but we, <laughs> we, we, we uh, no, I'm teasing. We, we went in and literally, and so because of that, he, he knew that his control freak issue was affecting his life. It wasn't about the politics at work. And so he let go, and now it's a very successful office. And, and so what we do is we go in and we actually go into people because any work issue you have is not a work issue. It's a personal issue. It's how you're reacting to that issue. Well, of course, because you are the work. So how will yeah, it be? Exactly. So, so mm -hmm. we go in on that premise and we get into the hearts and minds and the life purpose and the life change of individuals and we really show them how their lives can improve. Now, what's interesting is we do many exercises, one of which is, you know, put four things down that are important to you, right? If you looked at, uh, we actually draw a picture of a car and there are four wheels. Mm -hmm. My teacher, Karen Burr, it's a very, very great exercise. You write down each wheel something that is life important. And right. so everyone writes down, you know, work, a relationship, a family, the mistress pops up sometimes. But <laughs> uh, and, and then you say, right, take a wheel off. Right, and so oh, you have to think about that because now those four important things you have to kind of get rid of one. That's tough. I'm still grabbing a pen and doing this on the back of a thing. Just watch me. Mm -hmm. Right. So write down those four very, very important things, and anyone at home should do the same, actually. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, okay, and so, it's a really weird looking car, but that's good. Uh huh. And so in the four wheels, write down the most important things in your life right now. It can be anything. Mm -hmm. it can be people. It can be your study. It can be uh, um, holidaying once a week. It can be whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Now, get rid of one wheel. So which would you get rid of, you mean? 
yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter which wheel, but just get rid of one wheel that I guess in those four is the least important to you. Scary me, that's quite sad. Mm -hmm. It's very tough. Okay. Right? Mm. Get rid of a second wheel. No, no wanna. Yeah. Okay. And guess what? <laughs> what? Take take out the third wheel. Oh. Okay, this is really bad. I think we right? have to fire you. Okay. Now, now, what are you left with? Um, my kids. Right. Most people are left with family, wife, kids, something. Now, mm. everyone at work. I, in all the years I've done this, I've never, ever seen one person who has been left with the wheel called their work. <laughs> because it's not the most important thing in our lives. Yet, we spend all of our time, we sacrifice most of our life at work. And so, if work can help you change what's important to you in your life called your kids, your family... Mm -hmm. How much would you love to work now? And that's why the logo we have at Business Gym Global is love to work because that's the only way. You've got to invest in people. And, and, and what companies do is they start to make you more motivated by putting a nice snooker table in the corner or making a bar and they make the environment pretty. So you can now go and take a bit of time out here and you can go for a meeting there. But it's not about a change within. It's about a change around you and that's not good enough. If so you're one, saying that because when I go through these wheels, I think I, I ultimately work is not as important as I think it is. What I need to do is learn to do what? I miss that. If you learn to invest in the uh -huh. things that are important to you, right? then you'll be so much more motivated in your work. So you're saying that instead of telling someone, let me make your work environment good, yes. you're saying, let me make you feel good, yes. and that will show up at work. Let me change your life about all those values that you have, about investing in yourself, about seeing how your nature lets you down, how, you know, we, we kind of excavate the layers of a person's ego. Yeah, we, you, you we, help them rebuild and uh, understand their actual core value system, yeah. of what they think is important. Exactly. And it's so simple. And, you know, one of the things that we do, and similar to what we spoke about in, in, in the second session, was mm. if you think that life is not random, or if you want to just consider that for an idea, that for a moment life isn't random, which means nothing's happened to you by accident. Everything has a purpose somehow. Everything is perhaps for something in your future. Maybe pain that's happened to you is for something to help you in your future. Maybe something you go through that's so tough is going to remove your child going through the same thing that was as tough. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, if there is a sense to life, then in that case, there's a sense to you. You're not by coincidence. You're not random. And, and the point of you, as Darwin and many people have said, is to evolve, is to change. And so now the greatest enemy to success and the greatest enemy to anything innovative is resistance to that change. And so, so wait, wait, stop you, that a minute, stop a minute, I want to think about that. The greatest what was what? The greatest enemy to, to your own success is resistance. is resistance to change. Now, make that practical. Let's say every single day. Uh -huh. You come home and say, how was your day? Oh, this person upset me. That client was annoying. My boss came with this. I lost the promotion. I didn't get the bonus. This miracle happened. All the ups and downs of every day. Think how you reacted to everything that happened to you today. Think where you reacted in negative ways and think where you reacted in but positive ways. But change is scary, Marcus. It's, I think it's the most scary thing in the world. Right. So why would you not? I mean, I used to have the saying where I said change is inevitable, suffering is optional. But change is scary. So why would you not be scared? I think for one reason, maybe if you have such a desire to be more successful, you'll embrace change. Yeah. Or for another reason, where the pain of not changing is it's greater great. than the pain of changing. I and, still and, with you on that. And both those kind of work. And, 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 you know, if, if we, we sit down with people, and, and like in that particular example, the guy wasn't going to change, but he wants his, his home life to be better, and, and I proved and demonstrated it can be, and so as a result, he's excited by change. You just have to show a person that it's not so scary, it delivers results, 
there's fantastic benefits disproportionate to the minimal effort you make and and those business miracles really can happen so you're saying that I do feel like I'm translating Manny <laughs> I'm I just like trying it. to get yeah um, get it for me you're saying that if you can help someone get a good sense of who they are yes. get a strong sense of their value yes get a concept of what's important to them yes then the way in which they show up is not quite so subject to the vicissitudes of what's going to happen to them every day. Yes, They're going yes. to cope better with every day. Completely. They're, and they're going to have the strength of their internal system and their own compass to think, you know what, no, this is okay because I know who I am. Exactly. And, and, and you look at the corporate huh. issues right now and the conversations we have with companies – are about staff retention, unemployment. Uh, there is a very great issue in, in, in most companies. How do I attract and retain the best staff? Mm. How do I engage people? That's the real question. How well, do the I problem engage? is it's not money enough. Money is not enough. Exactly. That's what people have learned. It's definitely not. It might be in the beginning. I mean, when I was in recruitment consultancy, I could dangle a carrot of money or job promotion and people would bite. But now it's not. And it's not even about on-the-job training. Now, it's about life purpose. It's about life purpose. It's about really giving sense of, of, of you know, what is more than work. And, and that life-work balance is, is imperative because you bring your boss home and you take your wife or your husband to work with you. <laughs> you do. Huh. If you have a, if you have a row... i tomorrow. <laughs> if you have a row with your 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 spouse on the way into work, you're going to be reactive to your clients. And if you have a, a very awful day at work, you're going to be more snappy or less tolerant with your kids. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left, right? Now, in those few minutes, Marcus, say three minutes tops, that probably gives you one or two points that you can make. I can't with a, I run a small business. I can't come and find you and get you to be corporate and find what everybody, you know, their real value in my system. I, as this boss that runs this small business, don't have time to do that because I love them all, but man, could they just show up and do some work? Mm. What should I do? And, you know, female entrepreneurs are on the rise. It's the single biggest growing group globally, in fact, to well, today's we've, age. We've done courses in major companies on female leadership and the importance of female leadership. And I think yeah. the world is only going to get better oh, socially so when there that. are more female leaders. That's a fact. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Now, what are the two things or three things that they can do to implement that in their workplace? Well, I think, number one, you have to know that as much as you know, it's not about uh, uh, all the, you know, I know I should diet. I know I should exercise more. I know I should start a business. I know I shouldn't procrastinate, but I don't do it. Why don't I do it? Because, frankly, within me, it's too pleasurable to not diet. And so it's not about intellectual knowledge and courses of business of what we know. It's about getting to the spiritual core of who you are, of why you do what you do, and what's exciting. What do I do? How do I do that as, as, as an entrepreneur running a business? Well, you have to speak to me. Oh, we are speaking. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, okay, dish the dirt, Marcus. What should I do tomorrow when I come in that will help well, my staff? Well, I mean, the first it? thing I would do is I would actually chart all the places where you resist change. And there's a very specific way of doing that. The second thing I would do is actually I would get into the what we call the Groundhog Day of your business uh, behaviors and beliefs, which mm -hmm. is where you sabotage your next level. Um, uh, and, and then once you do that, you can start to really be more proactive, which is about owning everything that happens to you and turning it in front of you. Um, and then your leadership, your communication, your, 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 the way you give to your staff, uh, all changes. But it's all the result of what happens inside of you, first of all. Okay, so really what we're saying is that if I, as a business owner, want my staff to show up for themselves and ultimately, therefore, for my business, I've got to show up for myself. You have to because you know what? All your staff are looking at you. And guess what? If you're 15 minutes late, despite what's in their contract, you've just given them permission to be half an hour late. Yeah. Gosh, petrifying really, isn't it? I was or, doing really well with hand, all this. It's amazing because by, by showing them something different, 
it's it's a billion times more powerful than teaching, preaching, and telling. You show up early, and all of a sudden you lift them without even having to waste your words. So it becomes yet another family that we create, a community. Yeah, yeah, and 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 if you look at the the environment of the world, it's a desperately needed one. Everything which we think is big picture globalization is coming back to personal touch between one and one, people to people. That's a brilliant, wonderful place to end, Marcus. Thank you for being such a fabulous guest. It My was pleasure. really, really enjoyable having you on. And I hope everybody out there agrees as well. This is Living Raw Radio with your host, Geeta Sidhu Rob. And that.